Hi, everybody. My name is Lori Hannon, and I'm the Executive Director at the Center for Hearing and Communication. Welcome to Resilience and Hope in 2021 and beyond. We're very happy to have all of you here with us tonight and looking forward to some great presentations and hopefully help for all of us. Before we start with the presentations, we have some logistics in order to help uh, make your participation smoother. The webinar is accessible by both CART and interpreting. To view the captions, if you don't already see them, go down to the um, to the the bottom of your screen. Click more. If you're on an iPad, it's a little bit different, a different location, and click on show subtitle. To remove the captions, just select hide subtitle. Um, depending on the version of Zoom you're using, you should be able to move the captions around if you choose to, and especially if people chat and if it's interfering with the captions. Um, if you prefer to see the captions in a separate browser, click on the stream text link that's found in the chat and you can watch it in a separate browser so that you can enjoy it however you prefer. For any assistance with interpreting or captioning, please contact John um, and contact Brenda for technical assistance. If there's any problem with the webinar, the information is in the chat box and they're available and their email addresses are there to help you. Uh, this is being done in webinar format. So the videos and microphones of all of the attendees have been turned off. Feel free to use the chat to say, hi, let us know where you're from. Um, get to see whoever is there. If you have questions, however, for the presenters, if you can, please write them in the Q&A and we'll read as many as we can at the end of the presentation. When we begin, you'll see both of our speakers on the screen and you'll also see the two ASL interpreters, Barbara Finks and Jamie Steinberg. Once the interpreters start, they'll rotate off and on and you'll only see one at a time. It's now my pleasure to introduce Jeff Wax, the director of the Baker Family Emotional Health and Wellness Center at CHC, and Paula Gary, one of our wonderful psychotherapists in the Baker Center. Jeff is a psychotherapist too, and he is also wonderful. So I like to turn it over now to both Jeff and Paul. Um, hey, buddy. Hi, Jeffrey. Hello, this is my wonderful colleague. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for, um, for being here. I wish we could see all of you uh, and, and we're gonna try to have a conversation back and forth. Certainly Paul and I will have conversation back and forth. Um, so I wanted to start uh, by inviting you to be comfortable. Uh, I'm going to assume most of you are in your home, so be comfortable. Uh, and notice how you're sitting. If you're sitting, just notice how you're sitting for a minute. Take a breath, inhale, exhale, and note it is now uh, January 27th at 6.36. And here we are, we did it, we accomplished it, 2021. <laughs> It's here. <laughs> and that feeling, that's resilience. We did it. Um, Paul and I are gonna do a back and forth as best we can. Uh, we'll answer questions as best we can along the way and definitely at the end. Um, so what is resilience? We're gonna start with a, a definition. Uh, Resilience is the feeling or uh, the process of adapting well in the face of adversity. And we've all encountered adversity this past year, for sure. Uh, significant stress, trauma, some tragedy, some really, really harsh uh, life experiences. Uh, resilience is bouncing back. We all know, one of the things I want to uh, emphasize, I think Paul and I will emphasize, is that resilience, we all have it. It's nothing magical, it's part of us. It gets covered up, it gets uh, hidden, it gets inaccessible sometimes, but we have it. And just to kind of, if you don't believe it, uh, just I suggest, just believe it for now. 
Uh, right? So we all had the experience of bouncing back. We've gone through a difficult time. Um, and it's uh, in, in retrospect, we can look back and say, yay, I got through it, right? Uh, and it can be very, very present in our awareness at those times when we've uh, gone through, when we've gone through a, a difficult uh, experience. It does also uh, involve optimism. When we're in the middle of a situation that's distressful, hard to dredge up optimism, but it can be there. It's when we see that the doors are open or we allow, I might suggest that the doors can be open enough. They can be ajar. We can allow for the possibility that, that the door is going to be open. And in fact, sometimes very, very often, I hear a lot of stories, I'm sure you all do too, and I hope in your own lives that we can take uh, the experience of a closed door and do something beneficial with that. Um, I also would encourage, don't think so much of these things that we're gonna talk about, these concepts and ideas, the words as absolutes. Uh, we do that so often, you know, resilience. I don't have any resilience, period, done. Allow that, it, that it, it's there anyway, uh, that possibility. Resilience connects to our values our personal values, what we treasure, what we uh, can identify. They're, they also are not always so much in our, in our vocabulary all the time, but we have them. They connect to our personal values, love, family, being connected. Uh, it all motivates us to get, to get through. Um, I might call them as well, strengths, inner strengths, right? So resilience also, uh, does not mean does not mean that the experiences that we're going through are not difficult. As in, if I was more resilient, then I wouldn't be feeling. No, uh, that's life. Life is full of ups and downs, right? We all all experience it. None of us are immune to uh, the happenings in life. So there's emotional pain and there's distress and there's heartbreak and there's joy. Um, and the awareness of that, of, that we can have resilience, that we are resilient, uh, can go a long way in uh, balancing out that distress, the emotional distress helps us get through. Uh, in that sense, uh, we like to say, uh, Resilience is not, is, I'm sorry, resilience is ordinary, not extraordinary. It's part of our human makeup. Uh, Paul. I agree with everything you said. Um, in fact, I love that you started with taking a, a big deep breath because what I like to do is take a definition of something and break it down into a more human term that I can relate to and other people can relate to. And you know, the, the idea of, as you said, the, the idea is that we adapt well to stress and to change when we are being resilient. In a year like 2020, I think we could change it to be to adapt period, because well is so different now than it might've been in 2019. And you know, hopefully it will be a year from now, whether we adapted period to all that we have experienced on so many different spectrums. So when I thought, what does it mean to me and to everybody here tonight? I think one thing we would all have in common is that resilience to me is every time a human being is faced with what feels like an insurmountable situation, takes a deep breath and says, okay, that's it. It's, it's, um, it, it is something that we take for granted. Like Jeff said, it's not an extraordinary thing. It's a very ordinary thing. 99% of the time resilience is recognizing something that you do, which you have never recognized before because you just took it for granted or you had to do it. How many times have we said, well, what's my alternative? Well, the alternative would be to do nothing or to take a, a turn in your life that would not be positive for you. So every time that we've, you know, whatever made, whatever made you get out of bed this morning, 
is resilience. If today was a day where you didn't know why you were getting out of bed or nothing looks like the same as when you used to get out of bed. And I think there are three words that can help us understand when we're experiencing resilience, which is, I think we're in agreement. That's what's the most important thing about tonight is we're all doing it every day, many times a day, but we're not necessarily recognizing our own strengths. And I think the three words that come to me to explain resilience is that something at first appears unbearable. That's, that's the word I think really encompasses it when we don't know what we're going to do. Bad news, another day in pandemic, however you view it, but it seems unbearable. If we sit with it for a little while and we don't run from it and we don't hide from it and we don't put the covers over our heads and we say, okay, unbearable slowly becomes bearable just because we're sitting with it, just because we're not leaving it. So if we sit with anything long enough, something that was unbearable does become bearable. The third step to that is something that is luckily for us part of human nature, which is hope. The, the times in our lives that we feel hope are so surprising to me because it is the next logical step after feeling something is bearable. Bearable means I can live with it. Hopefulness means what am I going to do with it if there is indeed something we can do about it. Most of the time there is. So I think it, it made sense for us tonight to address resilience in terms of the pandemic and in terms of quarantining and not being able to be out among our loved ones. Um, the thing that, I, that strikes me the most is that there's two things. One is that for extroverts, and those are people who get most of their value and most of their involvement and self-fulfillment in life from external forces, this is harder. For people who are homebodies, who are self-starters, who are um, couch potatoes, for people like that, I think it's probably a little easier. I've noticed with my own patients that the more externally reliant they have been in life up until now, the more they are suffering. So if that is you, if that's ringing a bell for you right now, just own it, it's okay, it, it makes sense. That's where unbearable becomes bearable to say, oh yeah, I am somebody who thrives on travel. I'm somebody who just starts to, to feel like they're depleting when they can't leave the house three times a day understand that that is going to make this harder. You're not losing your mind. That is why it's harder. It's because you rely on the externals in life more than somebody else might. And One Paul, of the, yeah. If I can add, uh, it also gives us, we're gonna say this a, a bunch of times tonight. It also gives us the opportunity, exactly as you said, if someone is more extrovert and it's really a hard time or the other way around, it gives the opportunity. So explore that part of yourself too. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I don't think either of us ever mean this to sound like it's easy. It's not, it's sometimes very, very difficult. I don't want to sound, you know, when we make a suggestion or here's a tip, it, it's not, it's not easy, especially when we're not used to it. It's not our natural self. Yeah. One of the things I think also that's been um, on, on piggybacking on what you just said about um, the trying that goes into the resilience. I think one of the most important things that's been lost is accountability to others. And by that, I just mean um, showering and brushing our teeth every day. We don't have to if we don't want to at this point. Um, exercise, keeping house. We used to do it because hopefully, well, people will come to visit and I want my house to look presentable. If people aren't coming to visit during a quarantine, we may be less likely to clean our house. Catching the 805 train to get to work. I used to do it because I want to hold on to my job. I don't necessarily need to do that if I'm working remotely. And just like Jeff was saying, now is the time with all of that removed that we have to do the other side of that, which is accountability to self. And that is something I think we all have problems with. We all have, um, we need a certain amount of accountability to others, whether it's in a marriage or to a job. We need that. It's part of our essential makeup as human beings. And I would say, you know, 80% of our lives at this point are about accountability to self. And like Jeff said, it's not easy. Even for those of us who have the highest of self-esteem or the, you know, the most, um, you know, needing our house to look good just for ourselves, even that becomes difficult when you think, well, you know, well, what am I doing it for? What's the point? I think we ask ourselves a lot. 
And this is where self, which is really what resilience is founded in, comes into play. We're doing it for ourselves now in a way we have never had to do before. And we can't help but be stronger people when we come out on the other side of this, if that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, to piggyback on that, uh, as we're saying, sometimes these changes, often these changes are not so easy, but at the same time, remember a little bit can go a long way. You know, when, when we think of, I'm, I'm kind of jumping to, and I think this was in one of the questions we had beforehand, how do I, how do I build resilience or, or you know, in a way of getting through, uh, one person wrote, and I absolutely believe in the power of creativity mm -hmm. and doing something else pick up knitting, take up drawing, something that perhaps you've never done before. And some of these things are, are you know, sound silly. You know, I, I, I think they sound silly sometimes. Um, I had a client just this week and actually made that suggestion last week about knitting. And she was like, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, this week she tells me she went out and bought, you know, yarn and, and needles and started, and she was like, this is like great. This is meditative. This is terrific, you know. So it, 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 taking that next leap, the door being ajar, the possibilities for. Yeah. Yes. Um, when Jeff and I were going over what we wanted to say tonight, one of the phrases we came up with that resonated for both of us was the magic is in the verb. And I've often said in my work that the opposite of depression is action. The opposite of most things in life is taking an action. Um, and, you know, based on what Jeff was just saying, you know, it, I, I equate all of this, like um, the things that we always said, oh, if I had time to do, all of a sudden in the last 10 months, we had time to do it. And we didn't want to do half of those things. We didn't want to learn Italian, even though we've been waiting for the day we could learn Italian. I don't want to clean that closet. But the way I'm looking at all of these things now is that it's very much like going to the dentist. You dread it, you dread it going from the minute, you even dread it while you're doing it. When you come out of it, you feel better. And that's what I think so much of resilience is about. It's about going through the action, even though it feels like it's logging one foot in front of the other to get to the other side. And then we start to feel better. Now the magic in the verb is about, that's how you figure out what you're actually doing that you might not be recognizing because you're just going through your life. Um, and some of the, the, the examples I came up with was if we identify a wellness routine, um, that is, that's industry, that's good. Maintaining the wellness routine would become resilience. Um, adapting to a hearing loss, that is resilience. Does it make it any less difficult? No, but the adapting process is resilience. Um, as we discussed, extroverts who learn to function in their house in a way that is somewhat fulfilling, that is resilience learning one's body again as a COVID survivor, if you have long hauler syndrome, that is resilience. That's enormous resilience. So one of the things that um, I wanted to bring in tonight were just, you know, one, one of the glorious parts of what I do is I get to learn from my people every day. Um, I'll see, you know, seven people a day, most of the time, six people a day, and I get to learn whatever's going on in the world, whether it's an insurrection at the Capitol or a famous person passing away, I get to hear this wonderful cross current of 40 people a week telling me what they think about it. And then I start to develop my own, you know, macro sense of it from what I hear. And when I thought of what, I, what have I heard in the last few weeks or months that struck me as especially resilient, here's some of them that I thought were really, um, that resonated with me. Learning to trust a therapist after a lifetime of abuse or bullying at the hands of human beings. That's an amazing sense of resilience to be able to start to trust somebody when you have not had trust with people in general. Um, being a single woman about to turn 40 who always wanted to have three children. That's me, you know, that's the kind of thing that happened this year that threw everybody off. If you had plans, if you were, if there was a clock of any kind ticking, this year basically put a block of about 12 months and counting in our way. And things that were time sensitive, things that we thought would be, may not be. That's when resilience is called for. What will I look like without that if I can't have that? Who will I be if it has to be another way? That would be resilience. Moving through another day, if you had a, a, a sudden hearing loss or if you had a, um, a gradual hearing loss that suddenly became much worse than it had been before. Moving through another day, trying to understand, trying to read people through their masks, 
I heard something just yesterday that just blew my mind. A married couple who have been together for many years, both deaf, um, they both sign. One of them was mainstream, the other one went to a deaf school. And when they were out together with their young son in the outside, they had their masks on. And the man suddenly started to realize that his wife was not able to read his signing. And it, it occurred to them for the first time in their entire marriage that because she had been mainstream and he went to a deaf school, she doesn't really understand signing as well if the lip reading is removed because he had his mask on. They never knew this about each other. The resilience is understanding that and saying, we have to find a better way to communicate when we have our masks on. These are the kinds of things that have been going on underneath our noses and we just don't notice. And now we're starting to notice. What's the next step? There's your resilience. Right. And uh, something I was gonna say later, but I, and I, I might say it later, but I'm gonna say it now as well. Uh, uh, looking back on past experiences and pulling from that. We've learned how to be resilient many, many times. I said this before, you know, we are, we're, we've all gone through difficult times before, but specific to like around hearing loss, when someone, uh, when there's a drop in hearing and, or when there's, when there's new words with your speech pathologist to uh, be uh, pr produced more, uh, more, clear, clearer, more, more clearly, more uh, clearly, these are the, the obstacles that are in the way and we accomplish. And it's it, these uh, life events, they touch the same emotional buttons. Uh, I often say to people, I like to use like this, this kind of a circle. This is a hub, hub of a wheel, hub of a, maybe a bicycle wheel. This is the emotion. It's anger, it's sadness, it's joy, whatever it is. And the spokes of a wheel hook on to various situations, right? So, and not all the same situations, but the emotional button, the emotional, uh, the emotion resides there. So in the same way, when we've gone through, again, when we've gone through something difficult, we know how to, uh, of course, a lot, a lot of people are talking about masks and how difficult it is to communicate. And it's about communication, right? So when people either uh, f first had a hearing loss or sudden or, or not sudden, but learning how to, and eventually, uh, hopefully, eventually learning how to communicate uh, in a really effective way with ease. I love that phrase, with ease, where it's smooth. How often does that happen, right? We cherish the times it does. It doesn't happen often enough, but we've learned from that. So the same situations are happening now, specifically with, with masks and communication. The same way as years ago, perhaps years ago, uh, perhaps yesterday, when I don't know how to do this, and then we figure it out. We try to figure it out and we come up with a different way or an old way we haven't used in a long time. Right. There's only two more things I wanted to say before um, I hand it back to Jeff. Uh, one of the two of the things that have really helped me personally, professionally and personally in the last year is um, finding your heroes. And the heroes, you know, like we've seen, the heroes can be the nursing industry. Um, you know, the heroes can come out of something someone says. When, when Amanda Gorman said um, at the inauguration last week, she said, our lives aren't broken. Our, our country isn't broken they're just unfinished. And that's very much in keeping with where we all are as people right now. We're not broken, but it is very much unfinished. And, and we don't know when we're gonna be able to keep finishing it the way we used to finish it. So we're finishing in a different way right now. The other thing is, um, I think what, what, this week, what this year has given us that I don't know that any other time that I've ever witnessed has given us is shared grief, the loss, the... Um, Nicole Wallace on her on her news show every afternoon closes it with a tribute to someone who has passed away from COVID. And I've had personal losses in my life this year that did not touch me as much as one she threw across the airwaves a couple of days ago where she talked about a couple who'd been together for 70 years who mm -hmm. both attract, contracted COVID at the same time and were at different parts of the hospital. Their last wish was that they'd be brought together so that they could pass away together. And they passed away holding hands within minutes of each other. I heard this and I just started to bawl. 
what I realized was I'm bawling for that, but I'm also bawling for my own losses, for the losses of those I love, for the people I miss that I can't get near, for the stories I've heard of, of, of people who have been um, prejudiced against in, in our country. There's so much to grieve right now. Grab onto that shared grief because we all have it in us and it's hard to, you know, when you have so much of it, you don't know what's gonna let it out or when it will come out. It could be someone else's story. Um, and that's, that's, that's just as, as valid as your own grief. It all goes together because we're all sharing a very similar grief across the world, not just across our, our city, our country, the world is sharing the same grief right now. And the last thing I wanted to say is, is we have this mechanism in us that I don't know that many of us are aware of that is the essence of resilience. In any situation we're dealing with, it could be the breaking point. I'm thinking right now of the breaking point. We have our good days with the pandemic. We have our bad days. We have our days where we're kind of going along and we're managing. And we have days where we think, I don't know how much longer I can do this, whatever it is. And I think what I've learned is that our head and our heart have this deal going on between the two of them. One is always going to be more affected than the other in that breaking point. Your head is going to be tired from trying. Your heart is going to be weary from loss. And one or the other is going to feel that it's at its breaking point. If you can pick out which one is feeling it the most, trust me, the other one will come in for the save. They usually don't have the same affliction at the same time. If your heart is hurting, your mind will come in and say, what do I need to do right now to make, to make me feel better? If your mind is weary, your heart will come in with a feeling of someone or something that brings you back. So just let the heart or the head come in for the save when you feel like you've hit your breaking point. It's beautiful. It's really those, the, the heart and head working in tandem in, 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 uh, in different ways. I, want, I wanted to, um, to now bring up a, a construct, a framework that I've uh, embraced, I found this years ago, and some of you may know, uh, often called the hero's journey. And I know it first from this uh, writer and scholar, Joseph Campbell, who studied uh, uh, cultures, different cultures, uh, storytelling, the power of story, the power of the human story, and how it shapes our lives. Um, and we definitely find when in, in a story, we find uh, inspiration and we can find connection. Um, his construct in this, in this has many, many, many layers. I'm going to make it really a, a simple version, which is basically the story begins with a character, with a main character, um, compelled to go on a quest. There's a, there's a life journey that has to happen. And along the way, the hero, either alone or with help, most of the time with help, confronts obstacles, storms, and witches, and giants, and COVID, and <laughs> heartbreak, and masks, and misinformation, mm. people telling us, no, you can't. Mm -hmm. And our hero, again, alone or with help and with, with comrades, uh, ultimately beats the odds, the obstacles are vanquished, the quest is complete until the next one. And we see this all around us. Every book, every movie, every TV show has this, a form of this construct. And uh, some, some, uh, some examples, Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, right? We could, we could deconstruct that movie for hours, but Dorothy, she's on a quest. She ends up on, in Oz, right? Her journey is laid out on the yellow brick road. She's got to, What's her quest? She's got to get home. And goodness, we, we know all of the obstacles that she um, uh, encounters. Um, Luke Skywalker in Star Wars, the ultimate quest. He's looking for his father. What happens along the way? We've seen those movies. Uh, another one I love, uh, Lord of the Rings, that Frodo, all of that band of, uh, of folks, of hobbits, Boy, are they on a journey, right? Their quest, oh my goodness, their quest is huge to combat evil, to, 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 to good and evil. They're about, they're about to save the world, right? And if you've seen those movies or read the books, unbelievable amounts of obstacles that they overcome um, or they get, they get through. So why do I, I thought of that and I wanted to share it with you because 
uh, you may be wondering, what does this have to do with me, right? Uh, what I would suggest is that we're all on that journey, right? We're all on that life path. And I believe that all of you, you are the hero. You're the hero of your own journey. You're on that path and you are already a hero. And again, past experiences, you were the hero when you uh, applied for, uh, a, co for a, a college that you wanted to get into and you got in or you applied for a job and you didn't get it and then you got the next one all of these that's part of our of our hero hero journey and not to forget because we're therapists what are the emotions uh, along the way the emotions are huge they're huge they are distressful they are agonizing they are full of hope and sometimes despair and anger and frustrations and uh we've probably said this but i'll say it again the the, the point of resilience is inherent in resilience is hope it's resilience is not the situation that we're in right the distressful situation we're in is just that how we get through that there's lots of different ways, but that's not, that's uh, resilience happens alongside that or uh, as we get through. So, you know, as Paul has mentioned too, we both said about COVID, right? What could be more, more of an obstacle, more of a distressing situation? Although you hear about people, I've certainly talked with people, you all, I hope some of you or most of you are in situations that, one might first think, this is horrible, this is gonna be horrible. And then it turns out, well, wait a minute, now I get to live out of the city or now I get to work from home. Maybe I always wanted to work from home. Maybe working from home is a real problem. How do I work at home with my kids there and school and all of those stresses, right? Um, lots of obstacles to figure out. And I hope you, we all have, I know we all have through these months figured out a lot. We've actually figured out a lot. Um, I'm just noticing the time and we probably, I wanna get to questions and if there's any way that we can create a uh, discussion, I know that's difficult in this venue, but um, happy to answer questions. There's a lot of material that, that Paul and I came up, uh, came up with, a whole section, but I'm going to hold it on really how do we build resilience, some of which we've been talking about. Um, I don't think Lori mentioned this earlier. We are happy to send, I'm happy to send you the material handouts that, that you can have uh, uh, through email. You know, I can send it to you uh, with, with uh, an email address. And um, I guess that, let's open for questions. Yeah, perfect, Jeff. Um, before I ask for a question, and there's a bunch of questions that came in, um, we will be sending a follow-up out to everybody. We have all your email addresses from the registration, <laughs> and we'll be sending um, a wonderful PowerPoint that both um, Jeff and Paul put together, as well as any other resources that we can come up with as well. It's a good time to say. We got a lot of questions um, in advance about how difficult it is to communicate um, with the hearing loss right now because of the masks. We um, did um, several webinars about communication, one specifically about masks, and we'll send you all the links to that there. Everything is recorded so we can send you all the um, information and then you can always feel free. You'll have our contact information to ask us anything about almost anything. Um, so, um, you know, let's see. Um, Maybe, uh, maybe, maybe let's start with you, Jeff, since you were the last to talk and then you guys can decide who should really answer the questions. Um, a question came in um, from somebody that was, how do I help my family feel comfortable being around me after I've been quarantined because I had COVID? Mm. Touching question. Wow. <laughs> I think the first, the first thought is uh, look at the fact, you know, show them the fact I'm better. I mean, it depends on the age of, of children. Uh, it was children, right? Laurie, no, it, it helped my family. So I'm not, I'm not sure. 
I had a sense it was maybe, you know, adults, but right. I don't know. You know, the, the, the answer here is finding the information. That, that information is, is the freeing agent right now um, to find the best information you can from the most sources that let you know when it is safe to be together again. And there is this divide now between people who have contracted COVID and people who are still trying to keep themselves from contracting COVID. There's, some would say there's pluses and minuses on both sides, but the more information you can get and share and agree upon, the easier it will be to find comfort together. I would also uh, also say uh, explore and find your comfort zone within with some of these and per perhaps other questions. Um, how do people feel? How do other people feel comfortable? Uh, you know, if if someone has had COVID, if someone has survived, of course, many many th thousands of people survive, get through it, the illness, and and get the test results negative. I'm good. You know, as 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 long as that is the presence, then people will hopefully family will go oh okay it the it's like a boat that that that's that turns over that get that writes itself you know and we get used to that again as well that's helpful it's also new it's just really it's it's so difficult to get through these times um another question um do you have a suggestion about how to overcome recalling a tragedy or a hard time in the past when you're particularly stressed or anxious now as so many of us are? Therapy, 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 therapy. That's exactly why you go to therapy. That's, that's post-traumatic stress, which I think all of us have to some extent, but now is the time. You don't have to do this alone. You know, if this has felt good tonight, reach out, get a therapist and start working through it. Start feeling your way through it. Great, it, great. It's Jeff, one of the... It's one of the, the ways of building resi uh, resilience is to, um, is to get support. And you, you're not alone. You are not in it alone. Um, from, from what I understand in the question, uh, if, that, if that past uh, uh, trauma really, of that past grief, it keeps coming up in a certain way, like Paul said, definitely get support, talk it with a therapist uh, is, is always, you know, great. Um, it's a feeling that's being held in. And, and it's, it's, I like to say to people always, <laughs> there's no right or wrong, good or bad. We're here to observe what's going on and, and see what that's about uh, for any individual, certainly, but to see what that's about. It may not be so, although grief, uh, sadness, it's hard to um, withstand. It's hard to hold that in our lives. Um, but it's a feeling and it's going to, uh, it's going to uh, balance. There's also been so many different episodes of grief for most of us in the last year in particular, but through most of our lives, we have multiple griefs. It's hard to deal with one grief if you haven't been able to stand up and brush yourself off from the one that came first. So it's not at all surprising if you're feeling like you have too many griefs on the plate. I don't know, some, some days I'm feeling this, some days I'm feeling that. We have to go through them and we have to figure out what we felt about each one of them. Um, and sometimes we have to unpack them one at a time. And sometimes we don't have that luxury. You know, it's really, it's really great advice. I'm just thinking, you know, Paul, you said, you know, now like people don't have the luxury. I know sometimes for some people in the past, a burden, not a burden, an obstacle for getting therapy is time and being able to travel someplace. And everybody, um, like to let everybody here know, not just at CHC, but um, it's, very easy now to get um, therapy of all sorts remotely. I mean, m the majority of the work that we're doing now at THC um, is remote and it's going really well. So if you're somebody who really never had the time, you know, well, now you may have more time. So Paul, I think you mentioned you have the time instead of cleaning the closet, you could go have some therapy. Um, <laughs> but if you're afraid to leave the house at this point, you know, um, you don't need to do that. And you could reach out to us, you know, either for us or to get other resources. Just want to let people know about that. Um, and it, it, this is a nice segue to a question because therapy surely is a really concrete strategy. A question came in about um, any other practical, really concrete strategies um, that you could recommend to be more resilient. Hmm. So I have five. There's five categories. We can we can uh, delve into them. We don't 
probably have time tonight, but uh, you know, actually I'm gonna go off to an aside for a second. In putting this all together, I kept thinking, wow, this is a fantastic group. We gotta have a resilience group uh, every week or some such, you know? I don't know how we do that, but an obstacle to overcome. So there's five ways of building resilience. Build your connections. Mm -hmm. That's with family, with people, with situations, with pleasure. Uh, foster wellness, encourage wellness, whatever that can be for you, whether it's meditation, which is great, yoga, exercise, physical, we hold these emotions in our bodies, any way we can get them out. It doesn't have to be a vigorous uh, physical exercise routine. It can be jumping up and down. It can be dancing, it, anything. Get it out, get it out of our bodies, shake it, I'm doing. <laughs> uh, find purpose. Mm -hmm. See if you can find some meaningful endeavor, something that you're doing. It could be knitting. It could be something that's meaningful in the moment. It does not even have to be a lifelong meaningful. Now this is my quest. Um, really embrace healthy thoughts, uh, positive. It's not, it's not uh, looking through rose colored glasses to tell yourself, uh, find find a um, what's the word find a uh, mission statement for oneself I I have and I meant to bring it to show you in the camera I have a uh, what I call a talisman you know lots and lots of cultures have like something they hold that gives that has a power to it right so years ago I had this uh, there are actually four pieces of metal with four words that are etched in it and I have it I don't really hold it all the time but I have it around my desk actually, so I, I look at it. We all see that on the news, right? We see people's homes. We I don't have anything quite behind me at the moment, but we often see people with like words on their po on, a, on a, the, the wall, right? So my talisman has four words, hope, magic, courage, and resilience actually. Mm -hmm. And I loved when I found those, those pieces actually in the gallery somewhere, uh, I thought, wow, these four together mean strength to me or that kind of thing. So healthy thoughts. And the fifth one is seeking help, seeking help. And that can be a therapist, that can be a good friend, of course, that can be a family member, that can be your child and you play and you sit on the, on the floor and you build something with Legos, you know? Uh, those five, those five is what I would say builds resilience. That's that's great. Um, this is um, a little a, a little similar, but a little a little bit different. Um, somebody wrote in when I feel really um, stuck or afraid, and I just can't really figure out how to be resilient. Um, I can't do these concrete strategies. Are there like two or three things that I could do or just say to myself? Like I don't know if they mean is like a mantra that will get me feeling better enough to actually really take some action? Breathing, breathing is essential in a situation like that, which I know sounds ridiculous, but you'd be amazed how often we forget to breathe when we feel like that. Give yourself three deep breaths. And like we were saying earlier, know that whatever you need is inside you already. Another Oz, sort of Oz, you know, remnant, it's in there already. Whatever you need is in there, it's in the toolbox. If it's not in the toolbox, that's when you lean to support to try to get it where you, where you, where you can find it. But most of the time it's, it's within us and it's just about breathing, calming, moving past the stress over the, the, dis, the dis-ease of, of the feeling to say, and this is the magic phrase for me is what do I need right now? That's usually going to be your first step to resilience. What do I need right now? It could be, I need a bath. I need to go into the shower. I need an ice cream cone. I need to open my favorite book and read the first line. It could be anything. It could be very random. What do I need this very minute to get me to the next minute? Mm -hmm. I might suggest also a, a, a quick, I don't, I was going to say a quick fix. It's really not a fix, but a quick way of, of easing. Um, if anybody is uh, loves language, I love language and love words and I collect, I have a whole bunch. That's where I disappeared. I just wanted to pull these out. I, I collect quotes. Um, I love that uh, President Biden in his, uh, I guess it was the, in the inauguration in the speech, but he's referenced these poets that he recites or these lyrics clearly I think has meaning 
for him, otherwise he wouldn't say it. And they're, they're meaningful, they, they hold a power. So I'll share one with you that I, that I have that I printed out, which is, let me fall. If I must fall, the one I will become will catch me. Hmm. Love that. Love I, that. Lo I loved one that, oh, let me see. The world is, this, this hooked in for me with uh, the hero's journey. The world is full of fictional characters looking for their stories. Hmm. So that to me was like, oh, I like that. That's kind of cool. But it made me think, okay, if I were a fictional character in my story, how do I want my story to go? Right? I'm looking for my story. So maybe the story is calm. Maybe the story is bake a pie. Whatever Jeff, gets us through. Say that, say the first one one more time slowly about falling. Uh, let me fall. If I must fall, the one I will become will catch me. If you, if you all take anything away from tonight, that is the whammy. That is the one. That, that's resilience in, in a most gorgeous nutshell. That's it. Yeah. We, we have it. So we will become what we need to be. We have to. Yeah. Wonderful. This is really, really, it's, this is so powerful. I'm trying to look at the questions and I'm trying to listen to the both of you. Um, I just want to let you know that there is a vote. There's one vote at least for your resilience group, Jeff. Um, so... <laughs> So maybe maybe we're onto something new. Um, there's a couple of there's a couple of questions that are all a little bit similar. Someone said um, asked about, you know, do you have any advice for overcoming emotional burnout? And what I would add to that is another question of more of a maybe even physical burnout, where people have asked, how do I try? How do I take care of myself when I'm trying to balance both parenting and working, especially at home? Um, how do I take care of myself? I mean, I, I think about the cliche about the oxygen mask and the airplane, you have to take care of yourself, but day to day, that's kind of hard to do. So what would you say, you know, it, the burnout is inevitable and so many people are struggling with this. Do you have any um, advice for them? The burnout's different than standard burnout because it's ongoing, especially for parents with kids at home who are also working at home. Um, I'm not in that situation, but it is the one I hear across the board since the day this started that has the longest level of burnout that just, it's, it's, it's a gift that keeps on giving apparently because you can never get out from under either of them. Um, one of the things, you know, this dep is dependent on the children's age, of course, but this is a, a, a great time to instill industry in the children, taking care of themselves to their best um, capacity right now, just as a means of a family working together. Not that I'm not there for you, I'm there for you. But you know, parents are learning algebra again for the second time <laughs> while they're trying to clinch a deal in Texas where they can't be. You know, there's all these things going on at the same time. It's about pulling together and doing things in ways to the best of our ability, depending how old we are, depending on how much industry and agency we have in us, but constantly looking at what needs to happen and the rules and who can do what. It's like, it's like um, in many ways, it's like being in, in a boat where there are holes popping up and somebody has to keep putting their palms over all the different holes before the boat goes down. It, it constantly means readdressing, what do we need to do this week? What didn't work last week? What, what can never happen again that happened last week? How do we prevent that from happening again? And you'd be amazed. Um, I see it with my own nieces and nephews. You'd be amazed at what they can do when you, when you ask them to, or when they feel the need to. Um, and a lot of it, I think, for parents is it's very difficult to be honest about saying to your children, I'm burning out or that I don't know how much longer I can do this. Think about being honest about it. Just open up and let it come out about what you need from each other. Um, we're equals in a family now in a way that we never have had to be before. The roles have definitely blurred a bit, you know? Right. I would only add to that uh, the sense of uh, something two of my favorite words that I say often in, in sessions and, and when, I, when I talk to folks, uh, safety and control, a sense of emotional safety and control. We can only control so much, right? We can't control that the school is not open and our kids are, are not in school, right? We can't control that. Um, but as best we can, what you can control, and I think what Paul was saying as well, just to, just to emphasize, 
be the you know the opportunity if it's possible if it's really possible the opportunity to be the, to be more of a team a family team and the team effort uh, parents I mean it's it's a lot of uh, uh, kind of standard ways of of being with kids as well hopefully you know honoring their feelings, their thoughts. What would you like? And you give a choice, one or two things or whatever the situation may warrant. But in that, as Paul said, being honest with each other, uh, it's, it's often, you know, it's often said in the past year for sure about don't tell people bad news. People can't stand, you know, people won't withstand information. We can withstand a lot when we yeah. know what to deal with. And then we know how we can control it, not controlling in a, in a rigid kind of way, but, but, but in a sense of control, things are okay. Things are okay. And the withstanding Jeff's talking about there again, that's resilience. The withstanding is the verb, that's the resilience. It's, this, is, this has really um, been great. I think we have time for maybe one more um, question. Um, and I, I think that this might be one that you could answer in just a couple of minutes. Um, how do you manage cabin fever, especially if you really are isolated? So it's difficult to have kids and be around and it's also equally or more, who knows, um, difficult to really be alone. And if you have medical complications and really are isolating yourself, what can you do to, to, to conquer the feelings of isolation and you know, what, what can you suggest about that? Because I think there's so many people that are dealing with that today. Can I feel that one? I know a little something about that. You sure can. Yeah, one of the fascinating things about this to me has been people's, no one's experiencing in exactly the same way because they've all got different circumstances. There are people um, who are living alone who literally have not experienced human touch, a hug, a handing, you know, holding of the hand in a year. And there are people who have been submerged in the same environment who can't get away from one another anymore. So everybody's got their own stresses. Not, neither one is ideal. But um, I'm, I'm somebody who is, you know, I'm very much a homebody. I very much, I live on my own. And for me, you know, the days when it's been, when I've gotten the cabin fever and I've always got a million projects going on that I can do in my house, I'm very happy that way. <laughs> When it hits me, I think, my God, this must be hitting people across the board if it's hitting me because it takes a lot for me to get cabin fever. But one of the things that we have to remember about this um, in, in staying safe, and one of the reasons you have to remember that you have the cabin fever is because you're following the guidelines. You are doing what is safe. You are doing what is right. You are doing what is responsible. Please love yourself for that. That is so hard to do. I'm a hardcore quarantiner and there are days I've had to say, no one is doing this as hard as I am. I feel like I'm doing this like a priest would be doing this and nobody else seems to be doing it with the same hardcore sensibility that I'm doing it with. But I have to remember I'm doing it for a reason. There's a standard we're trying to uphold. And if we can uphold it, we will as long as we can. So I try to forgive myself and try to love myself for being alone when it would be easier maybe on some days to break quarantine and not be. The question mentioned also that there's a medical um, part you know part to this where it sounds like there's a need to stay in because of a fear or a concern of not contracting it because of a comorbidity if that's the case you know uh, one of my patients has found a lot of joy in going out early in the morning because he doesn't want to deal with all of the the masks and some people not wearing masks and all of the, the stressors that just come from stepping outside your door find the time of day where you are and one of the things that is that, that can really help keep you sane right now is just to be so thankful that even though this thing is airborne, it's not in the air. It's not like the fallout from a nuclear war or something like that. The air is still clean. As long as we are distanced, we can go out and we can breathe in air, even if it's just for five minutes. We can go outside. We just have to pick the most responsible times to do it. And most importantly, like Jeff was saying, in a place, where, in a place within us where we feel comfortable and safe, wherever that would be. I hope that's helpful. But I know what you're saying it can be really complicated to navigate that. It's very isolating. Yeah. I think that's really, I think that's really helpful. And I'm sure everybody really appreciates, you know, you sharing, you know, how it is, how it is for you personally. And, mm. and I think, you know, I think there is, there is something you really touched on. If you've seen one person trying to get through this, you know, you've, you've seen one person, if you've seen a hundred, you've seen a hundred, everybody is 
is got their different rules and different life situations. And I think the only thing that's probably unique is it's really difficult for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that having this webinar, I can't decide if I'm sorry we didn't do it earlier. <laughs> um, it's been, I think it's been so helpful. Um, I think, you know, hopefully you could see some of the, uh, the chat comments. Um, it's been really well received. People really are happy for it and appreciative of it. And I can understand why. I mean, I get to see you at least on Zoom now and then. And um, it's just been really, really, really helpful and important. And um, maybe we will have a group, who knows. Um, so I, I thank you both for really doing it. It's been really, really wonderful. Um, I wanna let all the attendees know, um, as we said before, you'll be getting by the end of the week, um, uh, an email full of the slide presentation with more information. Um, if the quote, maybe that maybe Jeff, if that quote's not in the slide presentation, you'll put the quote in because that was, that was so powerful, and we can include we can include that. And we'll also give you some um, links and resources to prior webinars that we've done that will answer some of the questions that just weren't you know weren't appropriate to put into this one. And as well, feel free you can always email. At the end of this, we'll keep up. Um, Jeff and Paul's contact information and CHC's contact information, how to reach us, um, feel free to reach out um, because certainly we don't want anybody to feel like they need to go through this alone. If there's one thing we've heard from you is get the support and don't be alone. Mm -hmm. So we appreciate everybody being here. Um, I'm sure we will do you know, more webinars and uh, maybe that resilience group, who knows? Okay, so yeah. thank you everybody. Have a good night, stay safe. And thank you so much, Jeff and Paul. It's really wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate it. Take good care, everybody. Really. <laughs>